Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you this morning, as always. And if you haven't found a few things to be thankful for yet today, uh, it was snowing where I live when I left. And so you can be thankful for the sunshine and the lack of two inches of slush that was on the road that I was hydroplaning through on my way here. So uh, once again, blessed and uh, just being reminded of the many blessings we do have and can enjoy today as the Lord is faithful as always. So let's give thanks. We're going to pray. We're going to look back at where we've been. So once again, and as always, we can jump in and, and pick up where we left off and move forward as we've been looking at unto the Lord, uh, just once again, for understanding not only into who He is, but how He desires us to live and walk today before Him. Let's give thanks. Lord, thank You again for this morning. Thank You that we can gather together and worship You. Thank You that in song, in prayer, in our hearts, even without a word, may the thoughts of our mind lift You up this morning. May we put You in that place on your rightful throne as Lord of our lives. Not just in this moment, not just in this building, but in everything, in all that we are, in all that we do, acknowledging who you are, what you desire. You are a holy and faithful Father, that today you have chosen us to be your children of righteousness. And as we come before you today, I pray that once again, as we open your word, we would allow you to speak and you alone, loudly and clearly, to our hearts, to our minds, to the depths of our being, of what it is you desire and how it is you desire us to walk today. And so I thank you that we can trust that your spirit is about your work and will be convicting and putting your finger upon our hearts in those areas where perhaps today, once again, we have yet to bow the knee and surrender, lay down our lives and allow you to be Lord of all. And so thank you again for this morning. We thank you for your word. And thank you for all that you are in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, once again, we're going to pick up in our study in the book of Job. And uh, for those who perhaps haven't been with us, we've been looking at uh, some verses and some uh, reminders through Scripture of what happens when we pray to the Lord, when we have faith, when we believe and yet seemingly we do not receive. What happens when we pray? And as we've mentioned several times now, as Habakkuk did, we pray, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? I cry to you violence, but you do not save. And as we've been carrying forward in our time together, we've been noting and building off these verses in Habakkuk 1 and verse 5. It says, Look at the nations and watch. Be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. And so, as we move forward today, we've been looking at a few things. One of those, as we left off last Sunday, looking at this character, Job, in this book that God has preserved for us. Remember, not a book about suffering, but a man's journey of faith in the midst of it. Uh, remember this, uh, a book in which we've been reminded we may not be able to control all of our circumstances, but one thing we can always control is our response in the midst of them, right? And so often as we walk in this world, things happen, things we may not understand, things we may not understand why, and yet the one thing God has gifted us is the ability to control our response in the midst of them. And as we looked last week, we remembered this, that as we look at that response, and we were reading about Job, who it says, did not blame God and did not sin. It went on and also said this, as his wife in Job 2 verse 9 had said, listen, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. And it said this, but he said to her, shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept Adversity. We understood this as we left off last week, that blame is one of the greatest adversaries to growth. The more time I try to put and point the finger of blame, I take the spotlight off of me and I cease to grow. I cease to be able to make movement because I'm spending so much time trying to attribute these things to others' actions, others' faults, that I miss the very faults God may be pointing out in me. And so, 
We left off last looking at this. What are we willing to receive? What are we willing to accept from God? Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? And so as we open the scriptures this morning, I'm going to be looking at Job in chapter 9. And as we read Job's reply here to his friends, it's in the context that they have begun to say, listen, you, the calamities around you are your own fault. The calamities around you of your doing. And, and now we're going to be we're going to be left with this question: what will we accept from God? Only good or adversity also? And we're going to break that down a little bit. But the context, let me set it for you, is this. There's no other verses where if I could actually hush God, and often you would find me trying to hush my children, shh, right, in inappropriate times. Here's God, as Satan comes before him, hey Satan, have you, have you considered my servant Job? If there were any time, no matter how proud God was of me, there's no time more than I would be, hey God, shh, not now, <laughs> Not now. Thank you. But, you, you know, I love when you say my name. I love it. Have you considered my servant? Love it. Not now. <laughs> Shh, right? No, here's God. Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Satan's opportunity? Sure. But he wouldn't be who he is if you hadn't what? Blessed him, given him, protected him. And now... As God has allowed all these things to be taken from Job, and Job's friends are saying, you're at fault. Listen to Job's words this morning in Job 9 and verse 1. Job replied, Indeed I know that this is true, but how can a mortal be righteous before God, though one wished to dis dispute with him? He could not answer him one time out of a thousand. His wisdom is profound. His power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? He moves mountains without their knowing it and overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place and makes its pillars tremble. He speaks to the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He is the maker of the bear and Orion, the Pleiades and the constellations of the south. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. When he passes me, I cannot see him. When he goes by, I cannot perceive him. If he snatches away, who can stop him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? Right? Maybe those words cross my mind as I see him saying to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Here's me. What are you doing, God? What are you doing? He says this, God does not restrain him to his anger. Even the cohorts of Rahab cowered at his feet. How then can I dispute with him? How can I find words to argue with him? Though I were innocent, I could not answer him. I could only plead with my judge for mercy. Even if I summoned him and, re and he responded, I do not believe he would give me a hearing he would crush me with a storm and multiply my wounds with for no reason. He would not let me regain my breath, but would overwhelm me with misery. If it is a matter of strength, he is mighty. And if it is a matter of justice, who will summon him? Even if I were innocent, my mouth would condemn me. If I were blameless, it would pronounce me guilty. Now listen to this. Although I am blameless, says Job, 9 verse 21. I have no concern for myself. I despise my own life. It is all the same. That is why I say he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When a scourge brings sudden death, he mocks the despair of the innocent. When a land falls into the hands of the wicked, he blindfolds its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? Now, as Job cries out here, I want you to note this, that as they look at the calamity around him, he responds, though feeling blameless. It's all the same, 
And it is he, referencing God, who destroys both the blameless and the wicked. You see, Job understood this, that God in his sovereign rule had the ability and in his hands held both good and bad. The troubles and the successes, the hardships and the victories, he understood It is God who destroys both the blameless and the wicked. And yet, here's our question for this morning that we're going to need to take as our take home, as it were. What happens when God allows bad for good? Or for goodness sake, (laughs) bad things happen. Where do we stand? What perspective do we see? Because on one side, it leaves us with the question, is God simply the author of evil? And there's verses that that make us question. Listen to this in Isaiah 45. It says this through the prophet Isaiah. I am the Lord, there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, there is no other, the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Those are difficult verses. (laughs) I am the Lord, causing what? Well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. You see, God here... And we have to know by character. We know in James 1.13, he does not tempt anyone. Though the scriptures are clear, he will allow us to be tempted. Not a tempter, but allowing to be tempted. We know this, that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. 1 John 1.15 And yet that same God, light, no darkness at all, read the Psalms, will allow us to go through the valley of the shadow of death. Suffer seemingly an absence of the very light that he is. And so, as we've been referencing in our time together, and and perhaps this morning, looking for reasons of our calamity that often we suffer and see. Uh, We've been coming back again and again to Romans 8, and I think it's important uh, again to look back at Paul's writing because we've been reading these words throughout our study in Job each Sunday because they're important. And it says this, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. And now, once again, we're going to come full circle, as we've already been here before, but look at that point in place where we see, we know that God causes all things to work together for good. What happens when those things are inherently bad, but are working together for our good? We may not only understand, but ultimately, our maker has his method. And his methods are for our good. But as we look at what God does, what God wills, and what God allows, there are many reasons for calamity all around us. Often, we can look and we can see cause of calamity. One is sin. Sin in our midst. Sin in our lives. Back up a few verses in Roman 8. And and it says this in verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed. There's suffering. And here's part of that suffering. It says in Romans 8.20. For the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly because of him who subjected it. And it goes on and reminds us of this in Romans 8. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. What does that tell you? That when sin came in, there was a great calamity 
created, where the garden produced fruit, now there would be weeds and thorns. There would be difficulty, hardship. As we look at the scriptures, we see that our own sin, our separating ourselves, disobedience from God, creates that calamity. And we can't always look at our circumstances and say, the Lord's will, all good. Because sometimes we're walking in ways that were not the Lord's will, <laughs> right? Here's the Lord's will. Go into the land flowing with milk and honey and I will bless you. That's the Lord's will. And yet, what did the people choose? No, <laughs> No, we won't go. There's giants in the land. So God said, okay, I've got a new will. Walk around for 40 years. <laughs> they chose no. And the calamity that would unfold now would be of their own bringing. Their disobedience led to their own despair and destruction. And now God, listen was going to allow that bad. And there are times in which, I'll be honest with you, I fail, I sin, I find it hard, and, and, and my prayers are filled with this. Lord, you're able. You're big enough. You're sovereign. Why don't you just change me already? <laughs> Why don't you just make me do the right thing? You know, you know in advance, you know every hair on my head, you know I'm an idiot. <laughs> Perhaps this moment today, you could just snap the fingers and what? Make me the husband I'm supposed to be. Bam! Yes, right? Make me the father I'm supposed to be. Bam! Yes! Wouldn't that be amazing? And yet, listen, here's God's will for me to be a loving a uh, father, a faithful husband, for me to be, uh, 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 there's so many things that I fail at. <laughs> it's hard to count. I'm stuttering, right? Listen, uh, for, for me to be upright in all things, like, like there's so many, a provider, a this, a that. A and, and listen, here's God, though I long for him to just magically make me whole. Here's God. No, today, I'm going to allow you to be you before me. You see, his will can sometimes differ from what he allows, and there's a reason there, and that is something we've touched on before. Remember Genesis? God made man and woman, how? In his image. The whole purpose was a reproduction of his life and his love, because God is love. But to reproduce love, love cannot be reproduced without what? Choice, sacrifice. Because you can tell a robot what to do, but that robot isn't engaged in what? Anytime it's commanded, made to, it hasn't chosen. It hasn't reflected. God could have done that, chose not to chose to raise a people in his own image that could walk in his ways. But to walk in his ways, there would need to be choice involved. And that choice involved was also going to be between obedience and disobedience. To be faithful or unfaithful. And God was going to allow in all of this the consequences, a taste of what those choices made. And again, I've told you this before. So often as we raise our children and we're seeing again and again, they have the ability to choose every day. And we know that if we simply, and we found it different with each of our children, we have had kids who if we just look at them the wrong way, and I don't mean the wrong way in the wrong way, I mean in a good way, <laughs> You look at them sternly, they crumple within, and they know. You don't need to raise a hand, raise a word. You just look, and they know they've done wrong, and there's immediate repentance. We've got other children who you could look at them that way, 
Nothing. <laughs> Carry on. Another child, you put them in the corner, put them on the infamous timeout seat, and you should see them writhing in pain, though there is none, right? Put your hands on your lap. No! Urgh! Right? Tormented. And it's all it took. Each one of our children has been different. Each one. But in their choices, they've seen the reality. We've needed to act and interact in a way, not to simply make them robotically repeat the actions we've asked them for. Because once again, that may affect the outside, but God is always more concerned with what? What's going on on the inside, the heart. Not just the robotic on the out, but a heart change on the in. And as God allows this choice today, Obedience or disobedience. To love or to hurt. To accept or reject. To obey or disobey. In all of it. Here's God. As I've created you and allowed you to respond to me. I am sovereignly responding to you. And I am going to allow bad in your circumstances. And in all of it. Hope that this bad will bring the good. See, he is working in all things together for your good. No greater verses to me remind me of that work in which God consistently and constantly called people to himself. And yet, often these people would not choose the right way, often the wrong way, and in the midst of it, God would grab them and, and God would give them a shake. And for some people, it was a stern look. For some, it was a timeout. For others, it was this. Uh, for others, like Nebuchadnezzar, it was to turn them into an animal. Okay? A little severe. Uh, uh, more severe than the other. And yet, perhaps God knew what he needed. Right? Do you guys remember Daniel chapter 4? In, in which Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And in that dream, he sees a tree. And it's mighty. And there's animals taking shelter under it. And there's fruit abounding on it. And then all of a sudden, the tree gets chained and torn down. And he asks all the wise men, what did it mean? Finally, Daniel comes, who also carried the name Belshazzar. <clears throat> and he said this, My Lord, Daniel 4 verse 19 my Lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. The tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth, whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, which was food for all and under which the beasts of the field dwelt in, whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. It is you, O king, for you have become great and grown strong, and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky, and your dominion to the end of the earth. In that the king saw an angelic watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven, and saying, Chop down the tree, destroy it, yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground. But with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field, and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven." And let him share with the beasts of the field. Until seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king. That you be driven away from mankind. Your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field. And you be given grass to eat like the cattle. Be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time will pass over you. Until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. And bestows it on whomever, whomever he wishes. And in that it was commanded to leave the stump. With the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Therefore, O king, my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case 
there may be some prolonging in your prosperity. Did you catch it? God's judgment was not just wrath and destruction, but what? This will come about until you, what? Until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. What was God doing? Allowing calamity that would lead to the creating of a heart that was not wholly his. It goes on in that same chapter when God speaks out and says, you will be driven away from mankind. Your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field and you will be given grass to eat like the cattle. Seven periods of time will pass over until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and he bestows it on whomever he wishes. And immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled and he was driven away. You see, God was about to instill what might seemingly be bad circumstances for a good cause. The king needed to know. And there are times in which today, when we look around us and see our calamity, we can look at our own situation, we can see our own sin and say, Yes, Lord. I get it. <laughs> I brought it on myself. <laughs> but you know what's harder? It's easy in those times to say, God allows bad for good consequences to make a king see him and know him. You know what's harder? When the calamity isn't our own doing. <laughs> When you're someone who lives in that kingship, the king sins, and now guess what? Stricken, you used to be the one sheltered by the tree, enjoying the fruit. You are enjoying the prosperity of the kingdom. And the king sins, and now what? Poverty, war, difficulty. And now... By nothing of your doing, you're looking and going, what? Why? <laughs> and, and here's God. Listen, I know. I know you. I know the king. A and, and even, here's Job's cry. You're destroying the, the wicked and the righteous. Here's God. Yes. <laughs> yes, but I want you to know something. This season of bad... Though you may not seem or think you've brought it on yourself. And here's Job. Listen. I'm innocent here. <laughs> Though you haven't brought it on yourself. This time of bad is for your good. You may not see it now. You may not understand why. But at the other side, there's going to be something. One of these things today. May not only have been. And this is where it's hard. Because often the calamity in our lives, the hardest ones to take are the not ones brought on by our actions, our disobedience, our hurt, but the ones brought on by others, or so it seems. But here's the truth today. Remember the foundation of our study? God causes all things to work together for good. And the fact that this, even though we cry out, Habakkuk 1, we may not hear him, or he may not seem to see us. You may not see it. Here's God. I'm preparing to do something that you won't even believe. Ultimately, here's God, the end product for both you and the causer and all who are in it. I'm bringing about good. Do you ever think about this? <laughs> Here's God's will. Go into the land flowing with milk and honey. Here's Caleb and Joshua. God is enough. Let's go. Here's the people. No. <laughs> Here's God. Why don't you take a walk for 40 years and think about it? <laughs> 
here's Caleb and Joshua. You want us to go with them? Here's God. Yeah. Yeah. You may be righteous, but on the other side, and remember Romans 8, he works all things together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. And here's his purpose. Those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Because listen, you may not feel like you earned it or deserved it, but on the other side of it, you're going to be more in the image of my son than you were in the beginning. And you're going to walk with them in it. Today, this thing that is bad, it is going to lead for good. Go on and read in 2 Corinthians where Paul states, Listen, do not find yourselves falling into the same sin and temptation as Israel did. For they all walked through the Red Sea and they were all baptized in the same way. And listen, <laughs> they all experienced these things for our in." Instruction. All this bad is going to lead to some good. And by their example, their own experience, you're going to see a road and a path to righteousness that I want you to know today, Paul says. They rejected the rock from which the water flowed, which was Christ. And for our instruction today, don't reject. And so this morning, as we look at this holy and loving God, and again, there's been several passages we've been looking at in, in, in context. One of them has been these in which Paul himself again writes in 2 Corinthians, and I want to remind you, writes this, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations that he's received. He writes, For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Here's God. Hey, Paul, I love you. <laughs> but at this time, you may see something, and he even reference it as a messenger of Satan. Seems a little bad, doesn't it? But in it, I've got some good for you. What's the good? You're going to know never to exalt yourself more than you should. And so as we look, even with his own son, here's God to his own son. Hey, listen, they're going to insult you, persecute you, put you on trial, lie about you, you're going to have to suffer some bad. <laughs> but here's my will, that on the other side you'd experience what? An incredible and greater good. Forgiveness for the bride, the church, the whole. You see, today, if we go around spending time, and as we left off last Sunday, blaming, pointing, faulting. There may be many causes for our calamities today. Choices of others, disobedience, our own disobedience, hurts. Today the call is the same. Come to the Lord and in Him, though what other circumstances may seem bad now, Hold on for the good that is coming. Romans chapter 8. Again, what did we just read? I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Do you believe it today? Are you able to receive it today? Or as Job writes... Will we only accept good from God and not adversity? 
Today, have you considered that God has allowed the revelation, the embarrassment of your own sins, perhaps today, for your good? I hate it when I'm revealed. <laughs> And it's usually my family that has a great ability to reveal it, right? Have you considered that the hardships have been for good? Have you considered today that in your circumstances, though you may not feel in control, and again, it's easy to say, I put myself here. You're like Jacob, uh, not Jacob, Caleb and, and Joshua, and you're looking at a, a disobedient people. And you're thinking, I'm not one of them. Are you willing to receive from God and say, yes, you may not be one of them, but you're with them. And you're going to be with them. Because I don't want just them to be in a clear image of me. I want all of you. And today, whether it's yours or theirs, whatever the difficulties that I may allow today, the purpose is the same. Good will come. Good will come. And so today, what are your circumstances? What is the bad? Embrace the Lord in the midst of it. And as Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, whatever season, even now, as he saw the judgment coming, obey. Bring all under obedience that it may go well with you. The greatest hurt, more than any, is to go through the hurt and not learn what you were supposed to on the other side. Never find the good in the bad but become blameful, hurtful, and bitter. And that's an easy slope to slide on, isn't it? It is. But Job, though blameless, he knew. Hey, listen, God destroys both the wicked and the righteous. Who can contend with him? No one. But what we can is in all things embrace him. Because often what we do is fall short. That is in our evangelism to say, join Jesus, see him in heaven. Father of love, father of light, father of forgiveness, come to the Lord. But we forget. Oh, by the way, when you join your life to him, you're going to be predestined to be conformed to his image. He's going to squish you, beat you, rip you, <laughs> smack you, <laughs> and allow you to suffer the loss of life that you might truly begin to live. Oh, it's easy to embrace the idea of heaven one day. But if you embraced the conforming today, that in a world that has been, and again, what did we read? Subjected to futility. How much suffering in that alone have you embraced, not just heaven one day, but in the midst of the futility that we've been subjected to? God has good in store. God is making us shaping us, molding us. Molded by our maker's methods. We may not always understand. We may not always agree. <laughs> Here's Job. Really, God? <laughs> Who can contend? And even if I did, I'd just make myself more guilty. And yet what? Faithful to make us. Today, as we go out these doors... We don't want to embrace an ideology, kind words, but a sovereign God who reigns over all, even evil itself. Today, what do we read? 
will allow bad for our good. And we can be molded by the methods of our maker or grow bitter and blame. What have we chosen today? Let's pray. Lord, thank you that today you are a faithful and holy God. And there are times where I confess I do not understand. I wish you could just make me whole. And yet, you've allowed me to fail in hopes that not just my actions would change, but my heart. There are times when you've allowed me to suffer consequence so that I may see the truth of Christ. There are times when you have allowed me, perhaps even to suffer, from the consequences of others, and yet in the midst of it all, making me day by day. Thank you that as the clay looks to the potter, we know your purpose. We know your rightful place on the throne. And as we allow you to be Lord of our lives, may we consistently and constantly be reminded that in this moment, obedience is our good. That your eyes are moving to and fro throughout the world to uplift and uphold those who are yours. That today, from the very beginning, your purpose will be established. And that your purpose is good. May we embrace that today. Not changing our circumstances, but allowing you to change us through them. Thank you that today you are faithful. Your mercies are new every morning. And that wherever we are in this moment, we are defined by your love, your care, and your concern for each one of us. Thank you that you reign over all. And we pray that again today you would have your way within us. And as we walk out this door through the week ahead, in Jesus' name, amen.